okay and the topic of my report which is the last time and probably not um, for um, <clears throat> not uh, for the where many things interesting here and said about the um, oral therapy and metronomic therapy I have to draw some conclusions um, <clears throat> some main points which could allow us to understand where we are moving further on and therefore I tried to make, to make a bit provocative my top here. How to do this so that the quality of life um, uh, would not be the victim of uh, the longevity? Although the main top here is not um, metronomic therapy but systemic approach to treatment of systemic to, uh, to static breast cancer. And the first question we ask ourselves is what for? Why do we treat uh, metastatic breast cancer? Some time ago it was probably um, justified, but now it's um, quite clear we did so the patient could live. <coughs> and we look um, about the situation, we see that we have um, quite success. Here you can see the number of patients with metastatic um, breast cancer living, for example, in uh, the US. <coughs> uh, and you can see that year after year the number of patients raises. Uh, and uh, in the 10 previous years, the number of women living with metastatic breast cancer in the US uh, raised by one third. And uh, 2020 uh, is prognosed to double this quantity. So if we look at another slide, uh, here are the survival curves of patients uh, with early breast cancer which received ID1 chemotherapy in uh, 2000, uh, in the 1990s. And here you can see um, the survival curves of metastatic HER2 positive, HER2 positive cancer in the thousands. And you can see that effectiveness of the therapy of metastatic breast cancer raised significantly. Of course, we can treat those patients, but the um, duration of the, the patients living of their life uh, raised manifold. So if we ask uh, which are the most significant uh, needs of, the pay of a person, it's food, water and uh, sleep. But uh, speaking about patients with metastatic breast cancer, it's all the previous uh, time points, but also another one, effective antitumor therapy, with which uh, those uh, patients will live um, and with that which way they will unfortunately perish. What do we consider an effective therapy of metastatic breast cancer? It's a great many of uh, drugs and regimens. Just to list them, we require a health page and the same guidelines. We have a big, a lot of choice here. But who and how should make the choice uh, from all this um, opulence? <clears throat> if we return to the um, point of food, um, which is important, it's simple. Any person can um, choose um, how he will get uh, the needed calories, vitamins, uh, proteins, and hydrocarbons. Uh, you can eat uh, reds, uh, or you can have uh, a big table color, and uh, have his breast and his taste, uh, and any person can orient himself in what he prefers. But unfortunately, uh, speaking about uh, anti tumor therapy, the end uh, client cannot uh, see through the menu and choose from uh, those capabilities, uh, possibilities, uh, and he has to use the expert's help, our help. But is it right um, that we um, give advice that we act as sommelier of a kind, uh, try to tell a person what he needs uh, from um, uh, the drugs? Uh, do we understand the needs of our client right? If we ask uh, what one to the women, uh, if there's women or, mm, with metastatic breast cancer, the answer is too simple. They want to live longer, uh, to have um, longer oral survival, and they have to live better, to have high quality of life. <clears throat> but there's often another point raised when we are given a choice whether the patient should live longer or with better quality. It's not right. It's the same as to ask a baby well, whom he loves more, daddy or mommy. And we have a lot of choice and we can choose the good therapy for each female patient which can spare the quality of life and increase the life durations. It's not the choice between effectiveness and toxicity. The right choice is control of disease symptoms with acceptable toxicity of the therapy. 
But here is that rebel. We, we base our choice often on. If we remember the moment when we got our education, so we actually we were educated in the epoch in the year of aggressive chemotherapy. And if I look the knowledge up in my own head, the knowledge sticks there, which I got when I was starting my education and a specialty in oncology, the ERV did an axiom, and um, unfortunately you are often not replaced even biologically. Uh, good information which was uh, getting my head later. And what have our teachers told us? Uh, what that the oncologists believed in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, uh, it's maximal tolerable dose combined chemotherapy, uh, maintenance of dose intensity, and the region, the region. Uh, it should be complete remission, of course, and we can do anything with it. Okay, why does it run? We need to little at that moment about tumor biology, and we were basing on a very simple supposition. Tumor cells divide fast, and they are damaged by chemotherapy. They form the maximum toleration dose. Well, remember what knowledge you got and when you're starting to learn. So the maximum toleration dose do not require, do not let the resistance to develop, and using the combined therapy can lead to curing the patients. And if I remember the first uh, real success in curing some tumors, um, for example, Hodgkin lymphoma, were um, connected with a uh, combined chemotherapy. It was fatal, but we can cure, could cure a patient with Hodgkin lymphoma when we applied combined regimen. And actually, we moved quite mechanistically the success to all other tumors. At least our hubs went with us. We helped um, for great success in other tumors. And there were some predisposition for We could see that some of the patients which could reach complete remission of the state where cancer they lived for longer. Now we do know that it's um, actually um, the biological characteristics, purely biological characteristics, and not the role of uh, aggressive chemotherapy which was conducted. But actually, in the 90s, the 1990s, it's uh, the golden age of um, chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer. Then we actually believe that just a teeny bit of time and study, and we will cure all the patients uh, with the metastatic breast cancer. Well, I think no sane uh, clinical oncologist will um, conduct the regimen in the state of breast cancer this way now. And in 99, we did it, and uh, we hope that uh, the number of clinical remissions will be transferred to the number of um, patients over living long. So, what was our conclusion? Of course, the dose was too low, so we should raise one. And then the next stage came. It was the maximal tolerable dose with autologous stem cells uh, support. But unfortunately, it also didn't work. And the studies with um, maximal aggressive therapy in metastatic breast cancer didn't show um, desired effect. Therefore, we understood that breast cancer uh, turned out to be the mo more difficult tumor than, uh, say, Hodgkin lymphoma or germ cell tumors. Does it mean that there was no success for an, in uh, treating the metastatic breast cancer? Of course not. Greatly, the survival raised, uh, I think, um, in one scene, one and a half uh, decades, uh, the median uh, of um, so I love those patients arose, although it happened not the way we wanted, not um, in one move as we wanted. We've got some new drug, uh, uh, get some new drug, or giving it high dose. No, it was a revolution. It was evolution. Each new regimen, each new approach, allowed us gain a bit of ground and. Um, Again, a bit of months, some months or weeks uh, for those patients. So then, a resonant question, how we should uh, place, uh, in which order we should place the possibilities we had. So speaking about current ideology of treatment of static breast cancer, and probably the following. If changing the place of variables in this equation does not change the results, actually, whether we place vinorelbin first or taxanes, aggressive therapy, or um, non aggressive therapy, the duration of remission will be um, typically the same. So here we have a new criteria which became more important. Just better, like better tolerability and uh, lower resource complexion, uh, consumption and uh, 
the comfort for the doctor and patients. And there is some hope. I think there are some shifts in our country. I think we do not start now aggressive therapy within the receptive positive tumors, even if there are visceral metastasis. Although, unfortunately, early or later, all patients move to the stage of chemotherapy. It's the uh, most universal uh, way of treatment, to, which works in receptor positive and uh, receptor negative and triple negative cancer. But there, our humanism comes to an end. Um, if we think how looks the, the process of treating the patient looks like, um, it's uh, the following. In uh, the initiation of treatment, we usually have uh, the minor tumor mass and the minor tumor resistance. But this is usually a place where we use more aggressive approaches. As the first treatment line, uh, we give uh, combined therapy, then we think a bit and come to monotherapy, and then think a bit more and come to metronomic therapy. In spite of the fact that in the moment when uh, we give metronomic therapy, the tumor mass is higher and the tumor resistance is also higher. It's not quite logical. So we have to reverse this triangle, really. Why do we have to do it? There is a bit of data in favor of this approach, uh, the comparison of combined and uh, consequential monotherapy. We see that to combine chemotherapy, um, it uh, allows us achieving more remissions. It's more effective for uh, clinical effects in remissions. But where do we need uh, the number of remissions, remission rate, and uh, the remission deepness? In only one situation in metastatic breast cancer, in visceral crisis, in, in a situation where just a uh, couple of weeks and we cannot do anything with patients, whether we save her or lose her immediately. In all the other cases from my real practice, we have some time to think. We have to um, evaluate the sensitivity of the tumor to the regimen chosen and in this situation. Please, uh, I'd like to see which uh, happiness comparison of um, consecutive therapy and combined chemotherapy. Of course, combined chemotherapy. Uh, in full doses, it's rather unpleasant. And one sees clinical and the meta analysis for fibrin and trypene also confirms it. But monotherapy is better here. You can give metanolysis dose for longer without reaching some unaffordable un toxicity. And overall survival rate is just the same. The four the patients will live uh, the same amount of months, but better. Therefore, if we look at the European or American recommendation, we'll see that based on the data available, the preferable line of therapy is monotherapy. And what does it, do we base it on when we choose the treatments, uh, the approaches for treatment? Probably we are treating the patient for a patient's sake, not for our sake, not for the fact of treating Dan's sake. Therefore, his preferences should be placed first. He's the end client of what we do, the end client and end concern consumer of our treatment as therefore if you see the recommendation which we do have the you will become interesting it's preferable to use um, as the first line anthracyclines or taxanes but if the woman has doubts uh, um, about having alopecia it's gonna be a socially active patient uh, uh, which often goes uh, somewhere to meet people it is enough for a decision on using an alternative approach in 80s, uh, well, you could imagine our decisions based on such, I think, is alopecia. And another quote, which great quote from ABC recommendations. We often speak that treatment should be um, performed before progression or reaching uh, intolerable doses. But our view on which what is intolerable can be different from the patient's view. Therefore, here is a, a clear term which states that tolerability of toxicity should be determined in a conference with the patients, not by doctor alone. Why, why so? is it so? Well, there is a very ancient thing. We believe that taxans and thrusts are good, but let us uh, look up 
the studies uh, which uh, lay the basis for texanes there is a difference in overall survival when these texanes but we can call it dramatic once again when we change the place of variables in the equation the sum stays the same Therefore, we should use additional effects, the quality of life and tolerability. It's quite the same in HER2 -ER positive uh, breast cancer. Of course, uh, Texan should be used as a preferable drug part for first light treatment. But if you view the real situation, uh, there is a big spectrum of drugs uh, that will be among them, which give the same um, effects, rate and survival in combination with Bristuzumab. Why should we go further? If we shown that there is effectiveness of monotherapy and uh, actually is comparable with uh, the one of combined written approach to, in terms of overall survival and is much better tolerated, why couldn't we use this metronomic approach about which Tatiana um, Yurin and Fiskozoki were talking about me, previous reporters? And it turns out that 80% of experts, European experts, agree with this um, approach. In some of the clinical situations, when we do not need a rheumatic effect, we need the maintenance therapy, we need to um, stabilize the disease. Metronomic therapy is quite acceptable. And of course, now we started to, to understand much more on tumor biology and progression compared to the, the 1980s, say. We've come a long way from the notion that the only the thing which can uh, explain uh, the action of uh, chemotherapy to drugs is uh, uh, suppressing the division of tumor cells. Now we see that uh, the uh, mechanism of action uh, uh, of tumor anti tumor drugs is often beyond the statostatic field, uh, which was clearly demonstrated and which is very important. Uh, there can be thousands of theoretical reasons for it to work, but uh, the real measure is the clinical data. And there is a grand amount of clinical data on using metronomic therapy, which tells us that uh, this method can be used and more. In some of the cases, it must be used in early lines of uh, metastatic breast cancer treatment. Uh, here, I like myself to take some of your slides uh, with references. Um, uh, slide from 2016, the data from 2016, and I can say, well, who do you like more, mommy or daddy? The right part of the slide on effectiveness, uh, in which we can see good data on uh, survival, or the left part on tolerability, in which we do not see the habitual grade three and grade four tech system. So we clearly have a, a real method uh, in which we do not buy the time of life with quality of life. And come to conclusions, um, we haven't moved a long way from chemotherapy, in spite of this method being one of the most old uh, methods. Uh, it uh, appeared far before, long before um, target therapy or endocrine therapy. It's still the basis of treatment pay for patients with metastatic breast cancer. Sooner or later, each patient switch get her chemotherapy. Aggressiveness chemotherapy, as we understand now, can be lowered without losing at least the effectiveness of treatment. Uh, and uh, also based on Cochrane uh, meta-analysis, it sometimes can be even more effective uh, for EFS. Uh, and new approaches for breast cancer treatment allow us uh, to, new, to use um, uh, our statistics in a new way. I like to uh, Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, do you have questions? I had the following questions. The criteria of choice you use were actually two criteria. It's uh, uh, actually the disease crisis or which other patients. Is it so? A visceral crisis. But the breast cancer is uh, heterogeneic. In 
some cases uh, list taxes can be good and some uh, cannot be. So my question is, in which variants of breast cancer uh, chemotherapy is better and in which metronomic therapy is better? Well, unfortunately, I don't have a clear answer for these questions. For in any case, each of the patients before standard treatment and any treatment, it's a closed book. We do not know which response we'll get. We can have some guesses, um, of course. Uh, in some of the patients, we have a small initial tumor, but uh, fast progression or um, uh, after adjuvant chemotherapy or lack of effect. Uh, in these cases, we probably have to use uh, something more aggressive uh, frontline therapy. If it's HER and T-positive so tumor with a um, good therapy of a good control, long therapy, a long period of good control and um, hormone therapy, with uh, probably a teeny bit of uh, visceral involvement. Uh, this uh, is a preference uh, patient in which we should probably use more uh, gentle approach with metronomic therapy. And uh, we've drawn an ideal picture here on how the quality of life um, uh, can should be connected with oral therapy. There are some patients which do not want or cannot um, bring uh, uh, the oral therapy due to lack of compliance. Uh, therefore, there is no clear answer here. Perhaps there is something you can see from your experience, from your own feelings. Uh, if it's a more aggressive disease, then it should be the standard chemotherapy. If you have a patient you cannot control, who comes from another city, for example, who went somewhere far, far, far away, uh, probably it won't also be metronomic chemotherapy. It will be something more um, traditional. If you can control the patients, why not? Could you please tell from the previous lecture, from your lecture, there is a conclusion. When we form metronomic therapy, and it's a uh, uh, hormone positive cancer. We can give simultaneously um, hormone therapy and chemotherapy. Which is your attitude to it? Well, this is experimental. Currently, it's experimental. For um, the studies on classical chemotherapy in combination with uh, endocrine therapy, they were performed um, some time ago cup um, with or without tamoxifen and there was no difference but now actually what uh, Professor Kazaniga tells us and what Marina tells us uh, we have um, a feeling that uh, metronomic therapy with um, uh, some drugs can um, work as an analog of um, cyclone, cyclone dependent kinase um, blockers, uh, and you all know what about the role in treatment of breast cancer. So um, it could work, but it's still experimental. It's not a standard, it's an experimental option. Was it right? To, to add the two, two points. Uh, I fully agree with you that uh, um, when you need the chemotherapy, you can think about the metronomic chemotherapy. The median time to reach a, a clinical response in breast cancer patients with metronomic chemotherapy is two months. Quite the same you need with the taxane, for example. First point. So you, I, in my opinion, I think that you don't have to look at uh, cancer heterogeneity, but uh, now at the moment a word of caution because we have data in HR positive patients. We are now going to publish the data in triple negative, but at this moment we don't have. And the second part is uh, fully agree experimental, but I hope that this could be the beginning of a cooperation to work on uh, on this topic. Well, you can see what um, 
remorse that could cause for acyclin dependent the kinase inhibitors uh, produces. Okay, dear colleagues, if we finished our today's program, I'd like to uh, summarize which was told before. Uh, we are going through evolution. We are greatly becoming more smart. We are getting new knowledge. Uh, but unfortunately, this process is um, takes too long, um, especially for the options which we think um, to be um, quite uh, studied and um, in to which we in which to which we are quite quite off. Uh, well, it concerns also our approach to metastatic breast cancer. We have to review our to review our opinion, and it's mostly hard to change ourselves for the habit. Um, it's part of that. So, we do not need to chase the immediate effects. Uh, often we do not need to strive for EFS. Uh, we have to ask what we need from this life. Uh, we need to live longer and better, and our patients want just the same. And now we have quite an arsenal of means. So we have to look back and think why do we treat the patients. Thank you.